Good morning, everyone. I see um, that many of you are joining us. I see that um, we have now 37 participants. Um, I want to uh, welcome you all for our first fall seminar um, on, on the web. So dear friends and colleagues, I'm very excited to welcome you today. My name is Melanie Tanili and I'm the director of the Armenian Studies Center at the University of Michigan. And um, it is an unusual time for us to hold the seminar um, and it is an unusual setting, um, but for us to keep our community safe and adhere to university travel and in-person meeting restrictions, uh, we have decided to meet you all in virtual formats this uh, fall semester. And hopefully we will resume in-person meetings in, in the winter. But before we begin, um, with our uh, webinar today, I would like to take a brief moment to acknowledge Professor Kevork Badakshian, who after four decades is retiring from the University of Michigan. And I, on behalf of the Center of Armenian Studies faculty, uh, students and staff would like to express our gratitude for Dr. Badakshian's long service to Armenian Studies and wish him a fulfilling and very happy retirement. I would also like to publicly thank Mrs. Jane Plasman, whose recent generous gift to the center will honor the legacy of her husband, Edward Hagob Nororian, by establishing a Nororian Scholarship Fund, which is a merit-based scholarship awarded yearly to the best and brightest of our students, and the Nororian Lectureship Fund, which will support an annual lecture series related to Armenian and Armenian studies and Mrs. Plasman's substantial contribution will no doubt enrich and further the center's programming and educational mission. So in the last month, we all in one way or another um, experienced some form of displacement in our daily lives uh, from work offices to improvised workspaces in our homes, basements, bedrooms, kitchens, porches, from classrooms to Zoom rooms, from dorms in Michigan to temporary shelters um, or parent homes in other states and countries. We've moved with speed, I would say, into isolation with family, strangers, or into solitude as shelter in place offices. Orders were issued and routinely prolonged, of course, in Michigan and around the globe. The demands for social justice um, in light of the killings of George, George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, and Armand Arbery, and the many other Black Americans moved many of us from isolation to the streets of our cities. Now we look, of course, in shock at the destruction of Beirut and the violence in response to protests against the government's negligence um, Beirut, of course, being a diaspora home city for many of our friends and families, yet again, aching. So nothing but deviation from the normative, normal, routine ways we encounter the world now is our everyday reality. To various degrees, I would argue displacement and deviation have become the new normal of our current moment. And hence, the Center of Armenian Studies has made the larger concern of displacement and deviation the theme for the 2020-21 academic year. Displacement and deviation clearly are not foreign to the Armenian community, and hence they might be a way for us to relate our current experiences to that of the Armenian past and present. There is no single place where Armenians have lived historically, just as there is no singular understanding of Armenianness over time. Indeed, both displacement and deviation would therefore seem tightly woven into the Armenian experience. In light of the current instabilities, uncertainties, and potential openings for change, we are looking forward to unraveling what displacement and deviation mean and meant in the Armenian context? How might we treat displacement and deviation as particular lenses for viewing Armenian history and cultural production, both modern and pre-modern? What might be a history of deviation or being out of place in multiple ways mean 
in the Armenian context. And most importantly, I would argue, what might happen if we ourselves deviate from received assumptions about Armenian history and cultural production. Setting us off in our endeavor to explore this theme is one of this year's fabulous Manugian postdoctoral fellows, Dr. Alex McFarlane, who's joining us today from their own place of displacement in Germany as they are waiting for their visa to be processed to, so that they might join us actually in due time here um, in Ann Arbor. As the American embassy in Britain remains to be closed, Dr. McFarland's journey no doubt is deviating from what would be a straightforward nonstop flight from London, where they have been working in the British Library to be digitizing the Hebrew manuscript collection as well as uh, the, Armenian, uh, the Armenian collection to our home city here in Detroit. But Dr. McFarlane completed their PhD in Oriental Studies at the University of Oxford in 2019 with a dissertation titled Alexander Remapped Geography and Identity in the Alexander Romans in Armenia. Since then, Dr. McFarlane has co-edited a volume with Matthew Kinlove titled Trends and Turning Points, Constructing the Late Antique and Byzantine World, the Medieval Mediterranean, and published a number of book chapters, one of them with the fantastic and wonderful title, This Shocking Lobster, Understanding the Fantastic Creatures of the Armenian Alexander Romans. Dr. McFarlane has also worked on a number of translations into English of Armenian and Georgian historical and poetic works. And as a postdoctoral fellow, Dr. McFarlane will be working not only on turning their dissertation into a book manuscript, but also begin a new and very exciting project that highlights Dr. McFarlane's linguistic skills, wherein they will examine an anthology of wonder tales in Armenian language but rendered in Georgian script to uncover social and linguistic interconnection in the South Caucasus. But coming to today, I'm going to tell you a little bit about what might be, what might be the, uh, the context or the content of today's talk. Um, wonder tales, myth, and ancient fantasy stories have been Dr. McFarlane's fascination. They have devoted their work to a particularly popular one, one work that we today might call historical fantasy fiction, in this case, ancient historical fantasy fiction that originally was composed in Greek in the fourth century and has not only been translated, displaced and absorbed into various linguistic traditions, including Coptic, Arabic, Persian, Armenian, Syriac, Hebrew and most European vernaculars, but also, as Dr. McFarlane will show us today, abbreviated, elaborated, amended, and added to. And this, as you by now know, of course, is the Alexander Romance. So the Armenian translators or authors of the 13th and 14th century, it seems, were particular poetic virtuosos who had no qualms in forging deviations from the original by writing short kafas that would accompany the text of the Alexander Romance. These short poems were to make the romances classical features and the impossible sides and species encountered by Alexander and his army that defied a medieval audience's understanding of the world comprehensible. Indeed, they note it was not always easy to sell all the creatures that populated uh, the text within the realm of Christian creation. The medieval consumer might have asked, what were they, were they to make of monstrous giant fleas, lobsters, foxes, giant plant men with saws as their hand and fish that could only be boiled in cold water? Armenian poets provided answers. And in this process, Dr. McFarlane argues, enacted a Christian remapping of the mysterious tales and creatures that made the Alexander Romans just so entertaining. <laughs> 
Dr. McFarlane's passion for Armenian and Alexander and their empathy and enthrallment with their subjects comes to the fore when they report of a visit to an 11th century monastery in Armenia. Entering the former residence of one of their deviant translators, Dr. McFarlane writes, part of the power of standing in a place wherein the poet once stood, composing the first kafas about Alexander is the less definable sense of standing where someone in the past once stood, possibly seeing the same paint, though much faded, on the arch above the door to the gavet between us, but we both had um, between us where he went in to pray and I went in to stand uh, in the dark silence. 700 years between us, but we both had Alexander on our minds. And I am delighted to be able to be in conversation with Dr. McFarlane virtually today and learn about their fascinating works. And we will open up for uh, Q&A afterwards. But in general, I think that no doubt Alexander will be on all of our minds for some time to come after this uh, interesting lecture. So I will give over the floor now to Alex McFarlane, our um, Manugian postdoctoral fellow for this year. Well, uh, thank you very much for that incredibly generous introduction. Um, I'm delighted to be speaking to all of you. Uh, in an ideal world, uh, well, many things would be different. Certainly there would not be a pandemic and I would be with you in Ann Arbor and not sitting in an Airbnb here in Germany. Um, but we make do with what we can. And one advantage of this is that possibly people are joining this conversation who might not otherwise have been able to join. Uh, I did not check the participant list, but it's possible there are people from multiple countries, which is fantastic. And it's always good, I suppose, to think of the positives as well as the many, many quite serious negatives. Um, so I will share my screen and have some slides which will be full of some of these wonderful creatures that have just been mentioned. Um, let's check that this works. Yes, share that one. Good. Um, I will share the screen. I will trust um, my colleagues to sound the alarm if anything is going drastically wrong with the technology. Um, and meanwhile, I will talk to you about this, which is going to share any moment now, full sized. Thank you. Yes. Um, so my talk is from the Alexander Romance to the base of the city of brass movements of medieval Armenian poetry. Um, and we'll be talking about the Alexander Romance in particular and poems that were written about Alexander. Um, and sadly not about these uh, round boys, which are fleas apparently. Um, so first of all, I want to introduce the Alexander Romance. It's a text that a lot of people have heard of, but just in case people haven't heard of it, um, it is generally known by various titles, depending on what um, tradition or language uh, it's being related in. Um, the history of Alexander of Macedon is the name in Armenian, um, and the history of Alexander is a, a fairly common name for it. And it, it is more or less a history of Alexander the Great, who conquered much of the known world um, many, many centuries ago. Um, <coughs> um, but it adds new parts of the story, um, particularly parts that couldn't have happened because they are more fantastical, uh, such as Alexander traveling to the edges of the world and encountering strange animals and impossible peoples uh, while he's there. Um, and also other events such as uh, his different parentage. In real life, he was, we assume, the son of Philip. Um, in the Alexander Romance, he's the son of the last Egyptian pharaoh um, who came to his mother Olympias uh, in the guise of the god Ammon in the form of a snake. Uh, which is delightfully illustrated. Uh, sadly, you won't be showing that, but it's um, it's a good story. And it's a very fun story to work with, and the illustrations are great, so I'm going to be showing you some of those throughout this talk. Um, the Greek Alexander Romance was, it's unknown when exactly it was written, and in fact there are many, many different versions of it over the centuries. It's suspected that the earliest version of it probably coalesced by about the third century after Christ. 
but there were definitely episodes in it that had already come to exist um, by that point, centuries earlier than that, such as Alexander's encounter with uh, Brahmin philosophers in India already existed many centuries before that. Um, and the Armenian Alexander romance was translated around the fifth century, uh, which is quite early in the history of Armenian literature, which only began about a century earlier with the creation of the Armenian alphabet. Um, it's not known who originally translated the Alexander romance, and it's not known exactly what form that translation took. It is presumed to be, based on what we have surviving later, a fairly direct translation of a very early form of the Greek Alexander romance, as you would expect from the early date. Uh, as is typical with um, Armenian manuscripts generally, our earliest surviving manuscripts are much later. There are two early manuscripts which date to around the late 13th, early 14th century, and then after that it's about the 16th century onwards. Some of these manuscripts contain a rich, beautiful cycle of illustrations, um, sort of, I can't remember the numbers off the top of my head, but something like 80 images, that kind of, maybe more, over 100, a really, really wonderful, exciting cycle of illustrations to look at and enjoy. Um, and then some of them are just the, the text by itself, um, which is less interesting. Oh, can I move this little screen? Yeah. Um, what we also see happening from around this time that manuscripts start surviving as well, this late 13th, early 14th century period, is the addition of poems, which we call kafas, added to the Armenian text, composed originally in Armenian. These are not translated from Greek or to my knowledge from any other transition, uh, any other uh, linguistic tradition. Um, and I'll describe more the poetic form of kafas in a moment. The first were composed in the late 13th, early 14th century by Khachatur Khachatzi, and then more were composed several centuries later, primarily by Vigorigorous Akhmatzi and Zakaria Gunanatzi. Um, and these kafas in particular are really interesting. As Melanie said in her introduction, they elaborate on the narrative, they comment on the narrative. Sometimes they repeat the narrative and really closely kind of taking phrases from the narrative and putting them into poetry. But a lot of the time they're adding new material, whether it is heightening the scene, sort of adding additional information to make it more exciting or more emotional, um, or adding a sort of moralizing tone to it, addressing Alexander and his nature or kind of explaining what's happening, and there'll be more on that later. Um, a note on the forms of the kafas, they utilize popular meters. One of them, the Hiren meter, is extremely well known in Armenian poetry, both in oral settings and in written settings, um, used for love poems, for poems of exile, an incredibly common poetical form that would have been very readily available to the people composing these poems and very familiar to their audiences. And then a very similar, uh, closely related form, the kafa meter, which has a slightly different rhyme pattern and a typically different syllable pattern. But they go very well together in the manuscripts. Um, they are, interestingly, in my opinion, part of the sort of medieval cross-cultural landscape that these texts all exist in. Kafas uh, originate in part from it is suspected the Armenian translation of the Arabic tale, the history of the city of Brass, which I'll be talking about a bit more later, which has in the narrative of it certain sections written in poetry. In this tale, these are inscriptions or laments typically in the tale, and these are translated into the Armenian translation also as poetry, and they use this kafa meter typically. And a brief word on how these appear on the page. So when you have manuscripts, as I said, some of them are very plain and they don't have illustrations, they don't have covers. Some of them are very ornate and beautiful. And these ones um, you can see on the side of my screen here, an example page. This is from a 16th century manuscript. Um, these are bats. They have human teeth in the text. I'm always sad that the artists never seem to draw the human teeth. But what we have on the page at the very bottom is black text, which is the prose narrative. And then either side of the image, we have green text and red text, which is the kafas. And then very, very tiny text above the image, in this case, is a direct caption. Um, 
but the cover's placement on the page really kind of accompanies the image. And in another manuscript, the, of the two late 13th, early 14th century ones, one of them is illustrated and has covers. And in that manuscript, there's often a red box around the images. And within that box, the covers are written in red ink. So they very much accompany the images in these texts. And they also stand out on the page by the use of a different color ink. And to an extent, they can be seen to caption the images, although it does depend on what the poem says. Uh, typically, the image and the cover are related in content. Um, so there is a caption element there, although obviously it goes beyond that. And in this particular manuscript, there is a literal caption as well as the more sort of elaborate nature of the covers. Um, and so I'm going to give you a few examples of them, specifically Alexander when he goes to the edges of the world, because I think it's the most fun and exciting part of the story. And it's where you get coffers about exciting creatures. Um, so we have a coffer which is write, writing about finding this river, which has a lot of strange things in it. It's got uh, terrifying animals in it. It's got strange stones. The black stones mentioned, if you touch them, they turn you black. Uh, it's got fish which only boil in cold water. It's got birds that kind of burn up in flame. Um, understandably, this is something that any audience would read and not necessarily comprehend, not really understand how these things could exist. And what the poem attempts to do is to explain them as saying that these are obviously part of God's creation. Uh, these are weird and strange, but nonetheless, God created them. Um, and we should obviously give glory to this God who inhabits all places. So the familiar places that we are, we are accustomed to with the aspects of creation that we are all familiar with. And then the unfamiliar places, God is also present, inhabits these places and created the things that are within them. We see this again in uh, ones about these headless guys, um, where the, the cover really kind of questions, how can these creatures exist? No one was born without a head is a sort of statement of, fact, um, at least no one who can, can survive, obviously. Um, these are admirable miracles. How did they come into being? And the answer is at the very top of the poem, and it's talking about, obviously, the creator, again, blessed creational name, um, questioning the creator, but obviously in their sort of understanding what the creator did sense. Um, and then we get my favorite one, which is about the shocking lobster, which in all the illustrations is a crab. I translated it as lobster because that was what the dictionary said when I first found it and then all the illustrations of these crabs but I love it being a shocking lobster um, and this is a really really fun one because it actually addresses this lobster kind of as an example for the Armenian people um, and then also talks about it being a model of the idol talker i.e sort of the satanic presence in the garden of Eden um, which is not good this this is a pejorative statement against uh, the armenian people and kind of suggesting that the armenian people have erred or sinned in some way um and it's 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 just a really really fun poem and trying to figure this out during my phd was kind of going why is this lobster or crab representing the armenian people they don't you know that there, there are animal metaphors that are very very rich and common um in the bible and in culture generally, you know, kings are lions, for instance, is something that is, it crosses many cultures. Um, not so much crabs or lobsters are typically not people or groups of people. Um, and what I found was one particular text called the Anonymous Philosophical Treatise, great name, um, which was a Greek text translated into Armenian, probably around in the seventh century. Um, and in this particular text that's talking about signs of the zodiac and associating them with various regions of the world, and it says cancer is of the Armenians, which are the lungs. Um, cancer obviously is represented frequently by a crab and also sometimes a more kind of crayfish lobster creature, uh, which, which suggests the kind of where this, this idea itself came from in terms of the, the author of this poem perhaps had read this text, or if there are any other ones out there that use the same comparison, which I've not yet encountered. Um, drawing on this kind of specific cosmological description of the world and then turning it into this Alexander poem and going, well, this, this shocking lobster is, is, is an example for the Armenian people, uh, which, which has no bearing on what's happening in the Alexander romance narrative itself, which is at this point, um, it just, these lobsters 
or crabs just come out of the water and attack Alexander. Um, they're not doing anything particularly exciting. Most of the landscape at the edges of the world is full of creatures and peoples that either attack Alexander or Alexander attacks them or both. Um, but this poem does a lot more and it sort of speaks directly to an audience of identifiably Armenian people and what is meant by that and what Armenianness means in this particular authorial context and, and any later audiences of this poem is, is potentially quite a big question that I, I wouldn't necessarily want to suggest easy answers for. Um, but we're probably looking at um, maybe a religious answer, sort of people who are Armenian Apostolic Christians. Perhaps this is in a monastic setting or at least in a group of, in a community of people who identify religiously as that particular religion. Um, certainly this is a religious poem. It's talking about the idol talker and Adam. So it's, it's talking about the creation story. Um, and and it's uh, sorry it's also interesting to me as part of it is how the lack of specificity gives it quite a lot of power which i think is essential when you're utilizing such a strange and unexpected signifier as a lobster or crab um, it doesn't specify what the armenian people have done but that leads it open to interpretation so any kind of sin can be interpreted interpreted as subject to this pejorative uh, which is, is a common motif in kind of um, religious texts. So even colophons as well at the end of manuscripts where it say, oh, we live in a very sinful time and our sins have brought these woes upon us if you know, the Mongols are invading. Um, you never have to specify the sins. You can just say, we've all sinned. Everyone's always sinned. There's always been a sin recently. And it takes all of this and puts it to use in this really specific way in this one poem, which I just, I love it. It's so good. Um, and also this tiny crab that is from the 16th century manuscript is beautiful and I love him. Um, to talk briefly about another version of the Armenian Alexander Romance, this is the abbreviated Armenian Alexander Romance. This came about uh, later on, uh, dating probably to the 16th or 17th century. It is, as the name suggests, a shorter version of the history of Alexander. Um, it also slightly changes how the kafas fit into the narrative. They are no longer sort of additions that kind of take ideas from the text and then interpret them into um, lobsters or anything else. They, they are part, they're embedded in the narrative. So Alexander will come up to something and say something and then what he says will be poetry. Uh, which is a very familiar form for, first of all, the translated history of the city of Brass, and also for um, other genres of writing in Armenian, such as Syrivep kind of love epics, also written in similar ways. Um, so it really, it fits in with these traditions. And whereas what I've seen so far, at least, is that these long, full-length, lavish Alexander Romance manuscripts are separate manuscripts that only contain the Alexander Romance. This abbreviated Alexander Romance can come in with other texts. And this particular one, which I showed the example of, is from a manuscript held in the British Library, which will hopefully be digitized at some point. Um, but I imagine their schedules have all been slightly slowed down due to the pandemic. Uh, this manuscript contains the abbreviated Alexander Romance, the history of the city of Brass, the history of King Palul, the history of the boy and the girl, which is a sort of questions and answers narrative, um, the history of King Zamhnazan, Balam and Yosefat, which is a very common medieval story, um, wisdom of Akika, again, a very common sort of late antique and medieval, and then songs as well, written and added to it as two. And so it's this very um, fun selection of stories, which some of which will get um, anthologized in print as well. Sadly, not the Alexander Romance, but some of these other ones really quite closely get groups together in Armenian. So it's really interesting to see them coming together in some manuscripts that also include the Alexander Romance. Excuse me. Um, I don't have a huge amount to say about the abbreviated version at the moment because I've only just started looking at it after my PhD finished. Um, <clears throat> But I will note that it certainly it really abbreviates the section of the edges of the world. Alexander encounters a lot fewer creatures there, um, mostly people rather than, than creatures, though he does encounter a giant crab, which I'm very happy about. Um, 
And the third type of manuscripts I want to talk about now is when we take these covers, which were originally alongside the narrative of the Alexander romance and often alongside these beautiful pictures, and then we just copy the covers completely separately by themselves. Um, copied in these anthology and miscellany manuscripts that survive 16th, 17th, 18th century. Um, naturally, the matter of manuscript survival doesn't tell us exactly when this first started happening, um, but it does seem to be a later phenomenon and potentially around the 16th century, we are seeing an uptick in popularity um, of the Alexander romance, given that more people are composing poetry around that time. Um, of these anthology manuscripts where the covers are copied separately, from what I've seen so far, some of them appear to contain quite long collections of covers, and potentially these are a full cycle of Alexander covers taken from the Alexander Romance narrative manuscripts and kind of separated out and put in there. Um, I haven't had a chance to go through them in length to find out if we're talking always the same unified set or if they're sort of identifiably taken from any particular manuscripts, but certainly we're looking at very long collections of covers. Other manuscripts, and these are the ones that I've looked at more closely, are shorter sets grouped around particular events or themes relating to Alexander. And these can be collections of kind of 30 or 70 covers, which is really not many at all, telling their own narrative arcs. Um, and the three that I've looked at in my PhD and I'm continuing to look at because the work definitely doesn't stop with these. Um, the first one is uh, a 16th century manuscript. Um, a note on manuscript names. In these cases, I'm using um, the Bernard Cooley system. The M in front of them means they're held in the Matanadaran in Yerevan. Um, so this manuscript, M3668, um, contains calendrical content, a collection of hymns ascribed to Grigas Atomotsi and Arakav Akhshetsi, and 30 covers about Alexander. And these covers comprise a really quite coherent story and verse about the turning wheel of fate, Darius's defeat at the hands of Alexander, and the scratching out of his good fortune. It's, it's very much positioned around this image of the turning wheel, uh, which gets included in one of the poems. And you see Darius first um, sending messengers to Alexander, who defies them and sends them back without their, uh, treat, without their tribute. And then Alexander kind of goes off and starts his conquest and later on encounters Darius and Darius is defeated as, as a historical and doesn't, we don't see him die, but obviously that is what we know to happen. Um, and these, these seem to come from several sources or at least so far it looks like they come from several manuscripts, but perhaps there is one example I haven't yet looked at. Um, the next one is another um, one of unknown provenance, 17th century, M7726. This contains um, the history of the youth by men, which is a kind of romance um, translated from Persian, I believe. Um, again, various songs and then 70 Alexander Kaffers. These Kaffers are mostly grouped around Alexander's meetings with three rulers, Darius of Persia, Porus of India, and the fictional Queen Kandaki who lived in it's sometimes called Mero, which is Sudan, but in the narrative, it's not remotely geographically coherent, somewhere in Mesopotamia, probably. Um, and the final one, which I've been looking at much more closely since I finished the PhD, where I already wrote on it, um, is M7709, which contains many of these songs. It contains several tales, including, again, the history of the youth Faman, the history of the city of Brass, and the history of the girl and the boy. And in this case, the Alexander Kaffers are added to the bottom of 31 pages, primarily in the history of the city of Brass, and then the first few pages of the girl and the boy. And these ones are less a coherent set than they are poems chosen in conversation with what's happening in the narrative of the history of the city of Brass, which is a story, as I said, translated from Arabic, first in the 10th century, translated from Arabic to Armenian, and then again around the 13th century. And then in the 16th century, Grigoris Atamatsi, who also wrote for the Alexander Romance, some kafas, he edited one of these versions of the city of Brass and added more kafas to it as well. So he was obviously very interested in these sorts of stories too. Um, and in this story, the history of the city of Brass, 
uh, the frame narrative is that the Caliph hears this wonderful story about finding jars in the sea that contain imprisoned uh, devs or jinns that Solomon imprisoned in these, these glass, these uh, brass jars. And if you pop the lid, they come out and utter something. Uh, so the Caliph sends off a couple of people going, this is brilliant, you've got to bring some of these back. And on their journey, this group of people led by someone called Amir Musa, uh, finds first an empty city full of, um, it's either full of dead people or just nothing. Um, and it's full of all this uh, inscriptions about, you know, in, in life you can have so much wealth and wonderful stuff and then when you die you just go into the grave and it's all very pointless. Um, then they find uh, a dev that uh, Solomon imprisoned in a column who tells the story about how he led his king to fight Solomon, which was a very bad decision. The king died, the dev ended up in the column, and then he points them to the city of Brass, which is another city, again, a beautiful, wonderful city, magnificent architecture, uh, full of dead people and all their riches, and again, covered in poetry about how you have all this stuff in life and then you go empty handed into the grave. Um, and so the, the Alexander couple is kind of engaged with some of this, uh, mostly about death and and around that, which I have an example of. Ah, first I have just showing you what this looks like in this manuscript M7709. Um, what you can see on the screen is the very faded red text will be part of the poems from the City of Brass narrative. And then at the bottom, you have a, a bit of an Alexander Kaffer added in what to my eye looks like a different hand um, and just written at the very bottom of the page. And then we have an example. So in the history of the city of Brass, the narrative says, this is one of the inscriptions. See that I was Lord of all these edifices and treasure. I resided in and possessed these copulas. I became immortalized from this sweet scent. Now see all this kingdom, which has become the home of wild creatures and birds. Stand in this place and see me in the ground. And the poem about Alexander added to the bottom of the page says, I was consumed like flesh and extinguished like a lamp. You set like the sun and you go into the earth to a prison. And so the, the parallel imagery of going, seeing, seeing the dead king in the ground and Alexander going into the earth to a prison at the end of his life sets this wonderful resonance up on the page between these two stories. Um, and there's a, quite a lot of that happening throughout uh, the narrative, which I think is very fun. Um, lots of death. It's been great working on stuff about death this year. Um, we then, we then somewhat surprisingly also have the poem about um, wonder working peoples and planted men, uh, which is one that came up in the full length Alexander narrative as one of many, many uh, poems about the edges of the world. And then in this narrative comes up and is on a page which is about the wonders of one of this, I think it's in the city of Brass, the wonders of the city and how glorious it is. So it makes sense on one level for it to be um, to, to have all this edges of the world wonder take place at the same part of the narrative as these magical, wonderful cities. Uh, but what's more surprising is that this is the only one of these edges of the world poems that gets added to M7709. Um, and that kind of raises questions to me about why that happened. Um, and this particular poem appears in multiple manuscripts in different ways, which we'll talk about now, complete with a wonderful cutout of the guy. So in the full length Alexander Romance, it's one of many covers about unfamiliar peoples and animals at the edges of the world. There's nothing particularly remarkable about it. It doesn't say anything particularly special beyond just remarking how wondrous and unexpected all of this stuff is. Uh, in the abbreviated Alexander Romance, uh, which, as I said, has a much shorter experience at the edges of the world with very few kafas. This one does still appear. Um, there are only there are three other kafas about uh, cannibal people, um, and then, as I said, there's another event where he encounters a giant crab, which he's, he, he and his men think is an island, and they go on the back of it, and then it starts scurrying around, and that's distressing. So they get off the crab. Sadly, there are no poems about this crab, though. Um, in the original Alexander romance, that's a whale that does that. And some of Alexander's soldiers go on it and then it goes and sinks into the sea. And then in the abbreviated one, it's become a crab that scurries around. So this, this one here, it's, it's interesting to see this is one of the ones sort of selected by whoever redacted the Alexander romance to make it shorter. Um, 
one of the fewer parts of the story that gets kept in the abbreviated version. Um, then, as I said, in M7709, it appears on a page where Amemusa and his group are in um, a splendid room, the throne room of the city's dead queen. It's got a gold lion like a living creature, a necklace of pearls like the eggs of a dove. So there's animal imagery, which perhaps uh, made whoever added these poems to the bottom of the manuscript think of adding a poem that also mentions animals and marvelous animals at the edges of the world. Um, and then it also appears in M7726, which was the collection that, as I said earlier, is about three rulers, about Alexander encountering the three rulers, um, Darius of Persia, Poros of India, and Kandaki of Mero. Um, then after he's encountered those three rulers, there's a few poems about him dying, uh, some of which also overlap with M7709. Um, and then finally, at the very end, there's this kafa about um, the natural sheep and the, the plant men. Um, and this naturally invites the question of, was there something special about this poem that meant that it kept showing up? Was it simply that people liked it? Um, which, you know, isn't special so much as a matter of personal preference. Um, is it simply that someone selected it and when they perhaps it was the perhaps when it got winnowed down for the abbreviated Alexander Romance, um, then other people kept drawing on that as their source. Um, it's not quite as clear cut as that though, because uh, for instance, M7709 is definitely not only drawing on the abbreviated Alexander Romance, at least based on um, the, the current edition of the abbreviated Alexander Romance. It's taking poems from other sources as well. So there, there seem perhaps to be multiple selections um, or multiple preferences, or, or perhaps it was just a very popular poem and people really liked it. Um, it's, it's very difficult sometimes to, to say why, why things happened in these texts, but I think it's very interesting to see the different places that it crops up in and to ask questions, even if they're not necessarily answerable questions. Um, and speaking of that and about sort of movements of poetry, um, Again, in M7709, where the poems appear at the bottom of the city of Brass Tale, four of these poems are also found in a collection of love highlands, or sort of love poems. Um, two of them are not present in any Alexander romance that I've seen or any other Kafa collections about Alexander. They seem uh, to be love highlands first, at least their subject matter does not name any of the characters from the Alexander narrative and is very readable as straightforwardly an expression of passion and love. Um, one of them is found in that late 13th, early 14th century manuscript of the Alexander Romance that has Kafas and names characters from the Alexander story. So did that perhaps begin as a poem about Alexander and then become a love hiron and circulate as a love hiron? Um, and then half of another one is also found in M7726. Um, again, did that begin as an Alexander romance poem and circulate as a love hyrone, or did people write love hyrones and mention sometimes the characters of the Alexander narrative? This is also possible. It was a very popular story, and while it's not primarily a romance in the sort of modern understanding of the term, there are elements of passion and love and ardor and stuff that you could include in that. Um, then, sorry, something flashed on my screen. I hope it's okay. Um, three uh, poems written by the medieval poet Freak are inserted into um, M7726. Um, and these are poems typical of Freak's oeuvre. They elaborate on fortune and the changeable nature of fortune. Um, and they are slotted into a sequence about Darius and his poor fortune where they make perfect sense in the sequence um, but it seems they were originally written by someone completely different. Um, and this really speaks to the fact that these poems uh, circulated in loads of different contexts and um, were shared by lots of different people and the creativity is not necessarily about composing new works every time so much as it is about recreating and repurposing work as well. Um, each time making it a new work, even though it may already have existed in a different context. Uh, certainly poems by Frick talking about the changeability of fortune mean different things in different places, and that's quite exciting and ditto loved ones. Um, 
So that is more or less it. So sort of what I'm doing in the future um, is there are more collections of Alexander Cuffers, which I need to look at and get a better picture of how these poems were circulating, which ones were popular. Um, I'm so far not basing it on a huge number of manuscripts, so maybe the picture is actually quite different and that should be really exciting. Um, and also I want to look at the connections between the wonder tales. I've obviously talked about connections between the Alexander story and the City of Frost story. Um, also many of these stories contained kafas. The City of Brass already, I mentioned that it has kafas to translate the poetry in the text and then they were added more later. Uh, some of the other stories I briefly mentioned earlier, like the history of King Palul, also uh, contain these kafas. And these kafas were also sometimes copied separately. Um, and it would be interesting to see which ones were selected and which ones were anthologized together. And it's interesting as well to think about what these personal choices mean about the people and the, the sort of community and social settings in which they existed. Um, can we consider things like uh, sort of the literary connectivity that we see here as also belonging to social connectivity? And I, I would suggest yes, and I think that there are interesting questions to ask there. And that's some of what I want to look at in the future, as Melanie said at the beginning. Um, I want to kind of look more at these connections uh, in the Caucasus and around kind of contact sort of Georgian and Georgian Armenian contexts, um, looking, for instance, at uh, M9265, which is an anthology of wonder tales, including the city of Brass, copied in Armenian, a bit using Georgian script. Um, but then there's also uh, a manuscript I'm curious about, which is a 16th century manuscript. And this has kafas from the city of Brass Tale copied separately and is copied in um, Achalgor, which is now Leningor in South Ossetia, which was apparently a very Armenian town at the time. Um, and going later as well, Tiflis, uh, Tbilisi had a large Armenian community and a large Armenian printing press in the 19th and early 20th century. Um, and they also printed some of these wonder tales, again, especially the city of Brass and some of the other ones. Um, so I, I want to explore more of these connections in the future and talk about that. Um, but for now, that is it. So thank you very much. Uh, <laughs> I hope that, that was enjoyable and you enjoyed all of the wonderful creatures. Thank you so very much, Alex. What a fascinating topic. And these tales are just um, uh, really wonderful. I um, am going to ask you a couple of questions that have come up in our Q&A. And so for the audience on the other side, I obviously don't see you folks, but um, you can use your Q&A uh, little button there to ask different questions. And I will start um, with a question that uh, was posed by uh, uh, Professor Catherine Babayan, who is uh, joining us from, uh, from Paris. What can you say about the poets, um, their voice first inscribed through the Kafas in the 13th and 14th century Alexander Romans, and then into their, into these discrete Kafa books in the 16th century? So I guess the question that is being asked is, who are these poet, poets that you've, you know, um, visited even sort of in the spiritual realm of standing in that monastery, who are these, these men um, that take it up on themselves to re rewrite the, uh, some of these texts? Um, that's a really good question. They are, they're all holy men. They all are working in monastic contexts. Khachito um, uh, Ketretsi um, was a, a holy man at the at Ketretsi monastery. Um, in the 16th century, Gregorius Atomatsi was Catholicos um, and was based at Van. And then uh, Zakaria Gundanetsi was based initially in, in the Van region and moved later to Constantinople, um, as many people did in the 16th century, because there was war happening again. Um, and yeah, so they, they were coming at this from uh, a religious perspective. Uh, which I suspect explains a lot of the religious interpretation of, of the poems um, and a desire to, I don't know, I don't want to sort of assume too much about their personal desires around the text, but based on what the poems themselves say, it sort of, it seems a desire to fit all these wonderful things into an understanding of the world that makes sense to them. 
mm-hmm. um, to to take all these things that that are impossible. You know, if you think of a headless person, a, a blemmy as they're known in, in medieval Western Europe, um, obviously that can't exist. Um, but they entertain the possibility that it exists, which I think is delightful. Instead of just saying, oh, this is impossible, this is nonsense. Um, they, they're engaging with the text very closely, which I enjoy. Um, but yeah, they, they, they wrote extensively. I mean, Gilgris Akhmati wrote, wrote many types of, of uh, poems. He wrote more religiously, and he also wrote uh, poems for the Alexander Romance and for the City of Brass. Um, Khajita uh, Kechratzi um, wrote um, laments about his current situation because he was living through the times of uh, Mongol um, difficulties. Um, so he writes, he, he also wrote laments about that, you know, so he wrote very contemporary, um, emotionally affecting poetry. Um, and then also wrote this um, fantastic poetry about Alexander that doesn't really refer to his current situation at all, at least on the edges of the world stuff. Um, one of the many things I need to do in the future is go through all of the coffers. Um, one goal is to eventually produce an edition, but that is, it's going to take a while. There's a lot of poems and I keep finding new ones. <laughs> it's, but it's, yeah, it's, 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 such, it's such a rich, uh, rich topic. And I think you, it's almost like there seem to be more and more kafas coming up. And it's also so interesting how they are incorporated within these, within these texts. Uh, in these different formats, right? On the one hand, on the bottom, and so on. Um, but uh, the question that um, uh, Michael Pfeiffer is asking ta- um, for you to answer is taps on to write exactly what you were talking about. And Michael says, thanks for a fantastic talk. Can you speak more about how the Kafas Christianize the Alexander Romance and to what extent the things the Kafas read through a Christian lens shift over time. Do you have the uh, questions in front of you also, right? Yeah. I probably do, yeah. Um, yeah, I, I, so far, the, to answer the second half first, it's so far not always clear when some of these poems are written. There is only one manuscript that's from um, the earlier time that we, so we can definitely say any poem that appears in that manuscript was added to the Alexander Romance by Hefteto Ketretzi. Um, there are many missing pages in it. So there are, there are chunks of poet, there are chunks of the narrative where we can't say who, who wrote them or who added them to the Alexander Romance if they've been repurposed from a different existing work. Um, and so far I haven't noticed developments over time in, in different approaches. Um, so with the, in the, so in, in the narrative of the Alexander Romance, Alexander goes to the edges of the world sort of in two chunks of narrative. There's one bit immediately after the death of Darius where he goes off um, off into a kind of remote landscape that's n- geographically fairly undefined, um, sort of beyond Armenia and Medea, so I guess Central Asia, um, but not specifically. And then another part where he goes to India, which is has a name that we recognize, but in the sort of tradition of classical geography is also about as unrealistic as uh, a non-named remote region. Um, and then the first one of those, the, the kafas uh, that are definitely written in the late 13th, early 14th century, um, mostly are, are about how kind of amazing everything is and they reiterate how amazing and weird it is. And then in the Indian narrative, they start to delve into this Christianizing aspect. Um, and then in the 16th century, you get um, more, more kafas that go into the Christianizing aspect. So it is possible that in the 16th century, there was an addition of like another layer of Christianization to it that had definitely begun earlier and was added to later. But again, it's it's not always possible to say for sure because of gaps in manuscripts and so on. Um, in terms of the, the first part of the question about the Christianization of um, the, the narrative, what, what I see them as doing is really kind of fitting this remote landscape into a, a Christian understanding of what the world looks like. So it's a very um, ancient sort of classical Greek uh, landscape of uh, sort of escalating weirdness. So the further away you get from the central familiar world of the Mediterranean, um, you get into weirder places. So places like Persia are a little bit strange and then further out into India or undefined Asian places. 
um, they're very strange and can therefore have these kind of populations of unfamiliar people with unusual characteristics and much more scary animals based partly on real things like real animals that are less familiar out there and also partly on just kind of a certain idea of the world. Um, and this landscape obviously continues into medieval literature kind of generally in Europe. Um, and what I think is happening with the Alexander romance and the Armenian tradition is explicitly naming this as, as, as all part of creation. So even if you go to the edges of the world and it's very, very weird and it all goes dark and you can't see anything and nothing lives there anymore, God still made that. Um, and God is still present there, even if regular people aren't. Um, and the, the poems kind of describe things as being either like Satan or very, you know, comparing them to, to the sort of more negative aspects of the Christian tradition, um, or, or talk about the, the wonder and glory of God who created them. Like, this is very weird and strange. So we definitely should give glory to God for making it because, wow, what, a, what an amazing God. Um, so it's kind of, and, and, and like that, that could really be, I think, a positive thing in the sense of like, wow, God is really amazing. Let's give praise to God for, for creating all of these wonders that we'd never even heard of until right now when we're looking at this story together. Um, and, and so I think that's an element of what's happening beyond the fact that it's also just a really fun story. And presumably people in the past liked monsters just as much as I like reading about them today. <laughs> I think we all do. It seems like it's quite ingenious. It, actually, it brings me uh, right to a question that's uh, being asked by one of our PhD students, Armin Afkarian, who, um, uh, of course, will uh, work with over the year. Um, and Armin is asking, is it possible to speculate on the audiences for these manuscripts where they treasure for wealthy benefactors, or could they have been read aloud for dictation, dicta uh, didactic or, enter or entertainment purposes in the monastery or the surrounding village folk? So I guess what Armin is asking, what is the context of circulation for these, these poems that you know, bring to the fore the glory of, of the creator or, or the devilish nature of creation as well? Um again a fantastic question and definitely one that i need to think about more in my upcoming work what i can say um at the moment is um so some of these manuscripts like the the one that all these images came from in the slides is a 16th century manuscript and in terms of size it's about the sort of height of it is about 20 centimeters or about eight inches um, so it's not huge for, for a lavishly illuminated manuscript. It's not enormous. It's, it's not something that if I had it in one edge of the room and you were kind of away, you probably wouldn't see much of it. So it's not sort of exhibition. Uh, so if it was being shared among a group of people, it was presumably an intimate reading group rather than mm. a larger context. Um, presumably with the ones that were lavishly illustrated, there was money involved in the process. Um, whether they were in specifically just in the monastic settings or some of those were out into um, lay people who, who wanted these, these beautiful manuscripts, I'm not sure. Um, so far in my work, I haven't uh, come across colophons that go into this in detail, but I also have colophons I haven't looked at. So perhaps this is something that can be answered easily at some point if I get to colophons and can just say, um, for anyone in the audience who doesn't know what a colophon is, it's at the end of the manuscript. Um, wonderful to have them, quite common in Armenian manuscripts. It's a bit of text that says, I, the lowly, pathetic, miserable scribe Alex, copied this by the grace of God for um, the glory of maybe my patriarch, if I'm, if I'm doing it in the monastic setting, or for the glory of uh, so-and-so, if it's a wealthy person who's paid for it, and then, you know, may God pray for his family, blah, blah, blah. Um, so they're, they're wonderful if, to have them because they, they can say the year, they can say the place it was copied, they can say who it was for, they can say the scribe who did it, um, and also give you historical information, which is super. Mm. Um, lots of stuff about how cold, my, I, my favourite one was something about how cold it is. It was really cold, so I didn't finish it until Easter, and I was like, yeah, Renee. <laughs> <laughs> So Armin will be really help, uh, happy about, about that comment because he's working or has worked also on colophones. <laughs> and um, so what a, uh, what a great, great um, interaction. So I have a question um, from Armenia by Ruben Malayan. Um, and he's asking, he's an artist and a calligrapher. Uh, 
And he's asking, have you come across any illustrations of the city of brass in the manuscripts you have examined? Mm. And he's also thanking you for your talk. Thank you. Um, I'm delighted people can join from Armenia. So that's, that's a definite advantage of the online format. Um, I don't think I have. I'd have to go back. It's possible because when he goes to visit um, this Queen Kandaki or Kandake or Kandakine, um, in later versions, I didn't get into this in the talk, but in later versions, including the abbreviated version, she is said to live in a city made of brass. And in the abbreviated version, it doesn't elaborate on that to confirm any sort of, it doesn't describe it in any way that would suggest it's definitely the city of brass, but I assume it is the city of brass. Um, it's, you know, it's my city, which is made of brass. She describes it in a poem. Um, so you could potentially make an argument that when we have her, um, when her, his meeting with her is depicted, there's normally some kind of background architectural detail. Um, of course, at which point her city becomes the city of brass is unknown. It is mentioned in the full length Alexander romance, but it's considered a later addition. There's kind of an added sentence. It's that she, she lives in this wonderful city or you know, he goes separately in the, in the um, in the full narrative, you go separately to a city and then there's a later interpretation that says, which is the city of brass. Um, and then in the abbreviated version, it's Kandake who lives in the city of brass. Um, and I don't know yet at what point that first happens. So it is, it would be interesting to look into whether um, any of those illustrations of Kandake's kind of architectural surroundings could be read as the city of brass or if they're captioned as such would be a great thing to find. Mm -hmm. um, I'll look out for that. I'm not aware of City of Brass manuscripts being illustrated, uh, which is a shame because it would obviously lend itself wonderfully to illustration because um, there's so many great details in that story. If I come across any, I'll, I'll keep an eye out. It's a good, great question, um, especially the Kandake aspect of it. Wonderful. Um, okay, so there was another question. Um, and I don't know if, if this is something that you've thought about, but it, it's it's interesting. And this question comes from Narek Safarian. Uh, and he's asking, are there overlaps or relationships between versions of the Alexander Romans and versions of the daredevils of Sassoon? And then mm. elaborating uh, on it, he says, as such, is there a reasonable account for how come the Alexander Romans was written down, whereas the daredevils of Sassoon was transmitted only orally? I just need to plug in my laptop so it doesn't die one moment. Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> right, there um, so, Daredevils of Sassoon, that I think um, the book that mentions it, I don't have on hand. There are very slight um, mentions and overlaps because I'm pretty sure the City of Brass shows. I can, and if I just open up my thesis and look for Daredevils, I will probably find it. There is a very, very tiny amount of narrative slippage there, I think, that I'm aware of. I think the City of Brass or Kandake shows up in um, Sassoon. Let me just check. Um, uh, right, the City of Copper, which Copper can also, Pogonze can, um, can be copper or brass or bronze, is the home of one of the characters in Dead Evers of Sassoon of Kandut Katun. Um, so that's that's a that's an aspect of slippage. I don't know about the Alexander. I have a vague idea there was one reference in um, uh, Azat Yagyazarian's book um, about the Dead Evers of Sassoon. I think he does make a reference to possible overlaps or similarities. Mm maybe. Um, as to why some have written and some are oral, I mean with the with the Alexander Romance it was <coughs> it was written really early um, and it was written in Greek um, and then translated as a written text. I suspect there was a very strong oral tradition as well of telling the Alexander Romance narrative and I suspect some of these poems to return to the audience question, I suspect some of these poems existed in oral contexts as well as written contexts. Some of the manuscripts that have um, just the covers copied separately are quite a much smaller manuscript, sort of the size of my phone today. Um, 
uh, which which you could therefore hold in the hand and so they could be portable um, much more easily and so perhaps they are notebooks um, of an Ashur that was writing um, copies down of their favourite poems or just someone who enjoyed them and wrote their own wrote these down or had someone write them down for them. Um, so I, I think there probably was a, an oral element to the Alexander Romance tradition It's just inevitably much harder to spot and especially when you have a really strong written tradition too, the oral tradition is kind of really, really hard to spot around that. Um, my guess to why the Alexander Romance is written is just because it was written and so therefore it kept being written. Um, but again, we, I'd love, we have so many centuries, we have about what, eight centuries between when it was first translated into Armenian and when uh, we start to have manuscripts. So what was happening in that time? Um, we don't know. <laughs> there, there may well have been um, oral elements there, or it may have been way less popular. Maybe it was a really big hit in the medieval period and got caught. So, you know, there's, there's, there's a lot of questions there. Um, mm -hmm. I think orality probably was quite important. So if, a follow-up also from Mr. Safarian, and this is, this is interesting, it relates to, to what you've been just talking about, but uh, he's asking whether or not Kafas could be analogous to the, uh, to the chorus in ancient Greek drama, commenting, mm -hmm. explaining, or giving asides of a narrative, if you've ever thought about these sort of correlations there. Hmm. I oh, it's been a long time since I've seen Greek sort of studied Greek dramas, <laughs> so I'm hesitant to to mm -hmm. make comparisons there. Um, I mean, some of them definitely, some of the covers definitely do kind of address Alexander. Um, mm -hmm. <clears throat> so that has perhaps a kind of um, Greek chorus like element to it. Um, may, maybe it, it's definitely it'd be a really interesting thing to to reread them through the lens of for sure. Ah, uh, that that would be a great idea. Yeah. Oh, thank you for that question. Um, yeah. The, the, I'm gonna read you, and I think I'm gonna make this our last question. Um, this is uh, a question by our other uh, Manugian postdoctoral fellow. Uh, and he says, "Thank you very much for this fascinating presentation. I've learned a lot." Most of the monasteries in the Armenian world were in remote mount mountainous regions. How did geography affect the context of the Armenian kafas? For example, did you discover any differences between kafas in manuscript written in Van and kafas in manuscript written in Tatev? Or are they the same, more or less? So how does, and, and you are interested in mapping things as well. Yeah. So it's an interesting question that relates to your work in many sort of layers. And so what does the geography of Armenia have or what effect does the um, geography have on, on these kafas or the, the composition of these kafas? Super question. Um, I, not, I, I don't know is, is the brief, is the sort of immediate answer. Um, I definitely would be interested to, to see that in the future. Uh, we, have, we have the problem with some of these manuscripts of not knowing where they're from. Um, and so maybe at some point it will be possible when I sort of have looked at even more of them to start to speculate as to where they might be from based on linguistic features. Um, so, you know, th there's a lot of, um, I didn't mention the language, but they, the kafas are very middle Armenian and very dialectal and, and up, but then you can have ones in the same manuscripts that have different dialect forms in them. So they're, they're really kind of jumbled up in a really cool and interesting way, but the one that's probably going to make the question of teasing out um, provenance difficult. Um, I, I, like, I certainly haven't sort of treating them as a broad entity. I can't say I've noticed any kind of immediate, um, immediate kind of local features. Mm. Um, it's kind of a, a sort of, they don't really engage with Armenia or the Caucasus kind of broader landscape very much. They, they when they're talking about the edges of the world, they're talking about a very imagined landscape and they don't particularly relate that to any real landscapes in any way that I can perceive. Mm. Um, so kind of on that most direct level of is the, is the actual literal geography in the poems relatable to the real world? The answer is mostly not because they're not talking about the real world. They're talking about an idea of the world. Mm -hmm. um, whether there are more subtle ways in which geography might have affected kind of selection, um, both in terms of what survived in that region, but also what the poet might have been drawn to as a person who grew up in a landscape or moved to a landscape. 
um, that's a more subtle question that will have to come out of um, making a very big spreadsheet, uh, which is still a work in progress of collating all these covers and the different versions of them. Um, I have a spreadsheet that's very long and very wide and it's only going to get bigger as I add more of these covers. And that will allow me to eventually ask interesting questions like this of the corpus. Um, mm -hmm. And that's how I'll edit it. But um, if that's a really, I love that question. I really hope I can give you a proper answer one day um, because that's a really wonderful question. Yeah, I hope, I mean, hopefully <laughs> the two of you uh, will connect of, of course over the uh, over the course of oh, the year so so in that sense you know you'll have plenty of time hopefully to to converse about this so in this uh, moment uh, and being mindful of everyone's uh, time and um, I would like to thank you so very much Alex for setting us off on our journey this um, the semester in the world of Zoom and uh, in these for virtual formats. And we hope, of course, that many of you who have joined us today will join us again. And um, we will talk a lot more about medieval and uh, sort of early modern uh, poetry this semester. And please check our website for information and uh, come and join us again. So thank you so very much, Alex. And if we were in a room, we would now give you a round of applause. Um, but I'm, I'm imagining that that is happening in, in, you know, the separate living rooms or wherever people are finding themselves. So thank you all very much for joining us today. And thank you, Alex, for this interesting talk. Thank you. Thank you so much for attending. I'm, I'm glad that there is enjoyment in this experience. Yes, and if there's more questions, people can always, of course, contact us. All right, thank you so much. Thank you.